Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks to all of you to stick around to listen to us. Uh, we're not we're the last one, but not the least the panel. So we we, we want to make sure you get excited uh, uh, panel from us. So and we want to make sure you don't fall asleep. <laughs> okay, my name is uh, Jun Feng Jiao. Uh, I'm a associate professor in community and regional planning also past chair and a founding member of a uh, Good System uh, Grand Challenge, uh, also the director of Urban Information Lab. Um, my research focus on smart city and urban informatics. Just two days ago, I learned I will become a right uh, specialist uh, for US government to assist in the, the Egypt national government to set up the policy for their national smart city guideline. They're gonna build the 15th smart city in Egypt. So I've never been to Egypt. So anyway, I want to share this news with you and uh, hopefully to learn from you as well. So um, today we're gonna talk about the challenges and the solutions when we come to talk about the smart city and uh, the wants, the equity and the transparency in smart city uh, movement. So. Uh, we have a great honor have a three wonderful panelists join us. So the first panelist uh, is uh, Leo Kao. Uh, Leo is a doctoral student in the School of Journalism and the Media and College uh, at the Media at the UT Austin Moody College of Communication. His research examined the digitalization of museum collection from an uh, uh, interdisciplinary perspective of culture policy research digital heritage studies and uh, mu museum studies. As a graduate student, uh, he worked for Technology Information Policy Institute. He also investigates the use of camera system by the public sector in the US, focus on issues of privacy, governance, technology, data, and the public engagement. Our wonderful panelist, second panelist is Chelsea, Kohler, Chelsea, uh, is, a funding, is a founder of a very famous smart city consulting firm called Digital City. She can with people across different sectors, focus on how technology can be applied to civic and social challenges. She's again a founder of Digital City, a forum of supporting the co-creation of smart and smarter cities and more connected communities. She also served as an edit at a large for Smart City Connect conference. As a matter of fact, she just got back from the city of Columbus last night for hosting that national conference. Um, the organization um, Smart City Connect provides news, networking, and education opportunity in the area of Smart City. Uh, Chelsea is uh, University of Manchester Seeming Industry Professional Fellow, a Marshall Memory uh, Fellow, and an Eisenhower Fellow. He's also the co-author of Smart City Playbook and, uh, again, um, creator of a Digital City, uh, Digital City Smart City Toolkit. Our third panelist, Brandon Krauss. Brandon is a business process officer at the city of Austin, Equity Office. He directs support to the department reporting under the government that works for all uh, outcome area for the city as well as department under the economic opportunity and affordability outcome area. Providing equity information in the area of small and minority business resources and also provides support for Austin Convention Center and a development service. Please join me, welcome our three wonderful panelists. Now I will turn to our panelists, let them talk about their work, um, so we get to know their wonderful work. So let me start with Chelsea. Sure, hi everyone. 
Uh, my name is Chelsea Collier. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you not only for all of your work and all your different disciplines. I've learned so much today. Uh, my undergrad and graduate degrees are from the University of Texas. I've spent a lot of time running around in nonprofit and private sector and a little bit of public sector and government as well. So to be back here on this campus feels like I'm finally home. So thanks so much. Um, I work at the intersection of smart cities and social good. So everything that we've been talking talking about today just resonates deeply. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one, Leo. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Leo. So first of all, my uh, supervisor, Dr. Sharon Strover, was supposed to be here. But apparently, her students are more important than you guys. So <laughs> she's teaching. Here I am. Uh, I'm a third year uh, doctor student at UT Austin. And uh, I have been working with Dr. Strover and other students on a TIPI, Technology and Information Policy Institute project, which is one of the six core projects uh, supported by Good Systems. So our project looks at the use of camera systems in different U.S. cities. This is the one used in the city of Chicago and is adopted by some other city as well. It's basically a node with a lot of technologies built into it. Some of them are environmental sensors, but there are also cameras and other technologies. And the next one is from the city of uh, San Diego. They were using the CDIQ nodes developed by GE, but then the technology was sold to a different company, so that's where the controversy began. Anyway, we these are two of the examples of the kind of technology we are looking into. We are looking at the governance principle on the local level, what types of uh, risks and benefits are being involved, and also how the public is being engaged in the process. So today, maybe you can share uh, what we, we have found in terms of what's, what's happening, and maybe more concerning what's missing at, this, at the nitty gritty of the ground level. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Leo, for joining us. Uh, Brendan? Hey, y'all. <clears throat> Sorry. Hey, y'all. Brandon Gross. I'm yeah, with the City of Austin Equity Office. And and as uh, Dr. Zhao talked about a little bit, I handle a lot of the like, quote unquote, like internal functions of the city. They like to think of themselves as a little bit separate from like the real work, but um, it's, it's really the same thing, obviously. And so that involves a lot of, of, yeah, like technology. It involves a lot of like HR type of stuff. A lot of the, I think, very boring things, to be honest, but a lot of where you start to see, um, like when our previous panel was talking about shifting that culture or, or the ways that we do things, that's really where you start to see those those processes in the, in the ways that we kind of present ourselves as a city. And, and I guess just to also say, because, because I'm only here because I'm a part of the equity office, uh, for those who don't know, we were, we were really like very directly community led and community kind of driven in a lot of ways. We wouldn't exist unless community had actually shown up um, to really start to organize and, and force the city to start to reckon with our major quality of life disparities in, in the city. Um, and so, and so every time, every, kind of thing we do since then, we really do try and take the lead from community, from those most directly impacted, and to really start to start to surface the ways that we as a city create those quality of life disparities and, and how we might be able to start, start addressing them. Thank you, Brandon. As you can see, we get a wonderful panelist. We get a, a voice from a different sector. We have a, a successful entrepreneur, we have a rising academic star, and we also have a caring policy maker. So we get a view from all different players in the smart city movement. So uh, let me dive into the question and start borrowing their brains. So the first question is, uh, let's start define a smart city. What is a smart city? What's a, the core principle of smart city? So the first question, um, should I start with uh, Chelsea? Sure. Yeah, I loved one of the comments from Professor Hauser earlier today, and he said, in the ambiguity, there is space. And I think that's the perfect framework to think about what is a smart city. And that question led me into where I am now as a founder of, of DigiCity. I started um, creating DigiCity as the question of what is a smart city, looking at research in the US and China. And when you get down to it in just the simplest, simplest terms, a smart city is all about data analysis for urban systems. 
but what's missing in that definition is people, which is at the core of everything related to a smart city. So every Smart Cities conference starts out, and I just came back from Smart Cities Connect in Columbus, Ohio, with this question. And what I think is beautiful about it is that everyone defines it differently. And when we started this work, there was a lot of frustration about that. There was a lot of tension about, well, this group defines it this way, and private sector defines it this way, and community advocates define it so differently. And in that space, in that kind of five or six years, which is not that long, but has felt very long, it's okay that people define it differently because it's this grassroots, democratic, very organic way of defining what a smart city is. I like to think about that definition, not just in terms of technology, of course, but why it's important. Of course, you have connected devices. Of course, you have data that's generated. Of course, you have government and a public sector involved. But the reason that there are smart cities is because we desperately need ways to more efficiently deliver service. We all need that as a connected community. Number two, quality of life for all residents in cities, and I don't just say citizens, but citizens and residents and visitors is at the core um, kind of intersection of, of that work. And finally, I think everything that we keep hearing about today is increasing the equity and increasing the prosperity of people who live, visit, and operate in cities. So that's a long answer, but I think that you all can find your own ways of defining a smart city based on what's important to you and how you can make a contribution in your community. Thank, thank you, Chelsea. That's a wonderful answer. Uh, a switch to Leo. Um, sure. I think, uh, thank you, Chelsea, for the wonderful uh, definition. Um, it's hard for me to define, and coming from an academic and maybe more critical background, one thing we uh, encounter very often is how do we define or confront the notion of consent for the public? You know, the, you were saying that it, it should be about the people. So how can the public become part of the smart city? You know, you see smart city with or without quotation marks from all kinds of literature. That has a lot to do with what this, the, the system are actually doing. So in one of our interviews with some uh, community activists, they were talking about, you know, me saying yes to the camera being built in, in my neighborhood does not mean a blank agreement to all the capability it has. So as the technology develops, and as Will just reminded everybody, there's always catching up to do. So how can we build consent, informed consent from the very beginning, and how can we update the notion as the technologies progress? That's, I think, one of the most important part uh, in terms of making smart city truly smart and not just a blank statement. Wonderful answer. I will turn to Brandon, who is uh, day in and day out dealing with the policy of smart city or related. To the extent that it actually exists in Austin. <laughs> um, but I know I think I definitely agree with what both of you shared. I think the only thing I would maybe add to it too is is when we start talking about issues of definition, right? The actual like definition to an extent matters less than the process you took to actually get there. Right, so it doesn't really matter if we if we all hold a different yeah. definition of smart city until we're all trying to do work on a smart city, and then it really matters what we all think we're talking about, right? And so I think the only thing I would add to it, right, is it it can be a lot of different things. Obviously, you'll hear a lot of different things. I think the biggest thing I would say is is this if if this is something you're starting to work on, if this is something you're also starting to like organize around is to really make sure that you're working from a common definition or even just establishing a common definition, right? Because if we're talking about like, we're just talking about like smart data analysis or doing better data analysis, that's a lot different than if we're talking about autonomous technologies, if we're doing some of the like more like infrastructural improvements, right? And the ways that you approach actually starting to implement the on the ground work for those is obviously going to be very different. So I think that would be the only thing I'd add is it, it kind of doesn't matter, but it also really matters. And, and it's definitely a conversation. It's definitely work that you need to do to, to, to establish that common language. Yeah, thank you for your wonderful answer. In your answer, I hear a uh, keyword appear again and again, which is people. So the second question is related to, to your answers. So who are the stakeholders? I know who are the important stakeholders to engage when we design smart city, when we plan a smart city? And why is it important to engage these different stakeholders from the beginning to the end of the, of the design of smart city? So that's the second question. I would uh, start with you. Um, sure. So um, in terms of stakeholders, actually 
our part of our uh, research project is to map out the stakeholders who are actually doing the groundwork, not just talking about them in terms of a policy or just smart city vision. So we have talked with uh, community groups, uh, activists, also folks working in the tech industry and also city uh, city officials. So these are the main stakeholders we have identified. And the problem we found is there is a, some disconnect among all these different sectors. So uh, to build a conversation that actually include everybody, that's I think what's important about involving everyone. And a concrete example would be in one city we were looking at, the engagement event is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. So who are you really inviting when you have the event at this time? So, and, who, and what's more important, who are you excluding by presenting this kind of engagement? So that's what the city has to you know, consider or all the decision makers have to consider when they are mapping out the, the landscape of, of, of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. so. That's a very wonderful answer. Uh, Chelsea? Yeah, this is the way that I define all of the different stakeholders. So, of course, you have government, you have industry, you have academia, and then the public and private sector. And in each of these kind of broader, um, I guess they're diamonds, um, are, are different sub-segments. So there's entrepreneurs, and there's students, and there's people who live in cities, and all different age demographics, and socioeconomic demographics, racial and ethnic demographics. So you can go on and on and on and define this, and then you can need this down to your city, your state, your neighborhood, your street, and look at all the different organizations that are all contributing to how do you how do you bring these different sectors together. And I want to emphasize that people in each of these sectors, and all of us, I'm sure, come with very different experiences, and we come with very different incentives. So piggybacking on what you were saying, it is incredibly challenging to help all of those groups understand each other. I think translation is a really big issue um, coming from a shared values or even a shared ethical framework is really important assuming that we are coming to this um, conversation with the with the best intention in mind is the work that we all have to do and not assume the worst but assume the best and we're all trying to figure it out so even the topic of community citizen and resident engagement is incredibly challenging and at this conference there were a thousand of us in Columbus Ohio all asking the same questions, which are how can we better, more effectively communicate with each other and with the people in our communities? We are learning how to do it, and it is very far from perfect, but there's willingness there, and I think that's important. Brenda? Yeah, I think for, for us in the equity office, at least, I think we're always really clear. The other thing I would say is we're, we're clear to use community and not stakeholder. And then to go back to the thing about definitions, right, we're real clear that when we say community, we don't mean like the, the kumbaya, like, we're all one Austin kind of liberal drum circle, right? <laughs> We're talking about directly impacted community folks, right? We're talking about, so one way we like to frame this a lot, right, is, is we start from like the actual problem statement, right? So what if, if, we're in, if we're like building a new AI or we're starting to implement new technologies, right? What problem are we trying to solve for? And then you go to who is most directly impacted by that, right? In the city, we, we, we like to joke a lot. We have a whole lot of uh, programs for kids where we didn't actually talk to a single youth. We didn't talk to any kids when we were actually designing that, and then we get to the end and we're like, I don't understand why they don't wanna be a part of this or why they won't attend, right? Um, and so for us, we're really intentional in, in framing it that way because like, it is important to get like a wide, a, like include everyone in the conversation, right? Get a wide kind of um, uh, like variable, like a wide piece of input, but you also really need to make sure that those who are gonna deal with this the most and be most negatively impacted are the ones you're centering in this engagement because at the end of the day, they're the ones you really need to be serving. You're the one, they're the ones you really, at least for us, that we're really serving in our office. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful uh, answer and the very uh, deep uh, insight of uh, uh, the major stakeholder of Smart City movement. Uh, follow that question, as we know, Smart City, at least a part of Smart City is about te technology. And uh, when we present the technology to the communities, as we learned from today, there's a lot of disinformation flowing around and also very hard to build a trust with the community. So how do you build a trust with the major stakeholder communities during the, step, during the uh, smart city movement? That's a question. I want to start with uh, Brandon, because you already mentioned the 
uh, community engagement, please. I mean, it's always interesting when we frame this from the lens of trust, right? I think the easiest way to stop, to, if you really want to start building trust, especially with those most directly impacted, I think the biggest thing in the city of Austin we need to do is stop harming them, first of all, and stop accelerating that harm, right? It's, it's interesting to me that we always end up, like, we end up in a lot of conversations about engagement and about, like, oh, why don't people show up or why don't they provide feedback? And, and you really start to dig into why that is, and it's like, Folks have shown up. Folks have given input. They've they've really like provided you the critical stuff. Very often in the city, we just don't do anything with it, or we make another decision. Like uh, the previous panel talked about balancing different interests a lot, right? It's it's interesting that in our balance, it almost never goes for those folks, right? Um, and so, like that's like at a very baseline, the thing I think that we need to start doing. And then beyond that, it's a it's a lot of very relationship oriented stuff as well. We. We try to pretend like we can just all of a sudden parachute in or show up in these communities and like, oh, we're gonna like quote unquote meet them where they are. And it's like, oh, we're at an HEB, but it's like, we haven't seen you at this HEB any time in the last 20 years, any time these people have been around, right? So it's like, why why, why are we gonna show up and, and like basically like trudge up all of our trauma, all of this stuff for, for no end essentially, because that's what, that's what we've demonstrated a lot of times in the city. And so um, particularly, I guess I would say within the smart cities movement, I think that it is also the thing that always is interesting to me is that we end up framing it from this idea of like community benefits, right? So it's like, okay, we're gonna go through like an infrastructural stuff particularly, right? We're gonna install these advanced sensors, we're gonna install these new cameras, and it's like, oh, we wanna do something for this community. So it's like, oh, maybe we'll we'll try and install, like we'll lay a new 5G cable or something like that. And it's, it's interesting to me, because to me it, it really does like unveil kind of the setup, right? Because it's, if you're giving somebody a benefit, that means that infer, like, it infers that they aren't gonna benefit from this technology in the first place, so we have to go and do something else for them to try and make up for that. And so for me, the other side of that trust, right, is, is really showing up from them at the very beginning of this and asking them what it is they want to, that they wanna see or what they need out of this or, or how it is that they will benefit from this. Because very often we start from that technology and then we start to work it backwards. Like, okay, so, what are the ways we actually start to like make this benefit? And it needs to be the other way. We need to ask from the start, how is this gonna benefit folks in this community? And then maybe we can get to some of that other stuff where it's like, okay, so what are some of the things that you would wanna see out of it? Thank you, Brady. That's a wonderful, wonderful answer. Uh, I wanna hear from uh, Chelsea, who has been a, a successful entrepreneur to connect a different party together in the smart city movement. So I want to hear your, your insight about this question. I'm so inspired by your comments because I think the first step and the first ingredient is humility. And that can sometimes be really challenging for a government entity, a municipality to do, and a municipality is made up of all sorts of different people from elected officials to staff members to city council members. Um, and I think coming at it with a spirit of humility is just exactly the right place to start. So I'm proud to live in the city of Austin today. Um, I think too, it is coming from a place of um, like you said, meeting people where they are, and yes, that can be a, a physical representation, but it can also be a values representation and just acknowledging the historical issues that have happened in a city like Austin, which is changing so quickly, it almost feels week to week, much less year to year, much less decade to decade. So that's a big challenge. Um, one of the, the research efforts that I want to acknowledge is one that's been inspiring me for the last year out of Hafen City University in, in Hamburg out of City Science Lab. And they basically started this research in 2016. I believe it might have been a little bit before then um, when uh, it was a result of the Syrian um, um, conflict there were a lot of refugees coming into the city of Hamburg a very dense city there's not a lot of space and refugees were locating in the city center right in the downtown and what Professor Kesa Seimer and some of her um, colleagues were able to do was create a framework where they could visually project the city and then ask people who were lining up to complain about all the different situations from all different from residents and citizens to the refugees themselves well what would you 
do. And instead of coming like this, now they were invited to participate in the solution making. So I think meeting people where they are and asking for their input. All of the solutions are here in our community. We simply have to be humble enough to come to the table and say, we don't know, but we can co-create these solutions together. And again, that is not easy. We're learning how to do this, but I think even coming to that process of learning how to do this with the spirit of co-creation and humility is, is where perhaps the answer lies. Wonderful, wonderful answer. Liu? Um, sure. I think uh, when it comes to trust, my question would be trust in what or trust in whom? Are we talking about the technologies being used or the actors who are using and deploying the technology? So if you think of the Google's uh, projects, set labs, set walk uh, labs project, sorry. So that's a failed attempt on the part of one of the largest private company trying to get into the smart city landscape. So there's some doubt among the public about a technology company, especially for someone like Google. But then if we're talking about the government, I think we can all agree that the population, the public, has varying degrees of trust in different units of the city government. So I'll give you one example. So in one, in one of the cities we were looking at, there was an engagement uh, a meeting, I guess, and one of the local community group members showed up. They were expecting the city officials from the utility, from the tech companies to give an introduction, maybe gather their input about what can be done about those smart street lights. But then when they showed up, it turned out the police were doing the presentation. Mm -hmm. They were in short re reassuring the public that it's all for everybody's benefit. We're not collecting information we don't need. But then this kind of maybe mission creep, you know, switching from one purpose to another, it's eroding the trust that's very hard to build. And that was in, that's in California. And just like California here in Texas, we're one of the border states where there are a lot of undocumented immigrants. So these are the most vulnerable groups that we want to protect and we want to benefit. But the way uh, the local government is presenting the technology, who are doing the presenting, has a lot of implication for the trust to be built. So that's a negative example, I guess, of not building trust from the get-go. Uh, maybe a good one is, you know, also for the streetlight, the, the, the local government is consulting with the community members, where do you want this light to be located? Maybe some corners prone to flood, so maybe an environmental sensor about water building up will be helpful. Or this corner is really dark and there have been some incidents happening, so maybe a camera is needed here for this location. So this is a very concrete, concrete example of gathering uh, community input, not just for the sake of informing them, mm -hmm but really having, inviting them to be part of the decision-making process. And that has a lot to do with, I think what Chelsea was mentioning, the, the humility. You are not just telling folks what we're doing, not just being transparent for the sake of telling, but really inviting everybody to make the decision together. So. Yeah, thank you, Leo, for the wonderful example. I'm glad you mentioned uh, how to build the trust. Also, you mentioned the, the, the failure of a sidewalk lab. So as you can see, when we build smart city, we have uh, many, many different disciplines. We have many, many different uh, stakeholders. So when you, why it's important to, to have a, a diverse uh, background or diverse stakeholder to engage in a smart city movement. And as we know, when we do interdisciplinary research, many times we run into problems. So what are the biggest problem or challenge you ever run into in a smart city movement and how you overcome that? I will start with you, Leo. Um, sure, so our project actually started with being very explicit to everyone we talk to that we are not looking at the police use of camera, not the body, ca body cams, not the police use of transportation cameras. That's our starting premise. But that turned out to be very far from what everybody is thinking on a daily basis. Maybe there are some knee-jerking reaction among the public, but that reaction is real. The kind of emotional burden is real. So as researchers, we have to adjust our premises and really take the police part back into the equation. So that shows us how important it is for the public to be a part of it. You know, maybe I should just stop saying public because it's 
some part of the public that's are mo that's most vulnerable. So for them to give their input from the very beginning is one way to reduce the impact of those knee-jerking reaction. The city wants to do something beneficial for everybody, mm -hmm. but with those over, you know knee-jerking overreaction, it's hard to get them started. So that's why for us it's really important to to get everybody in in the process. Thank you, thank you, uh, Charlie. What? What are the biggest uh, challenge when it comes to collaboration and how do you overcome that? Yeah, I think um, the lack of opportunity to be in the same room and to have trust that you can voice your concerns without being shut down and without being judged. <laughs> I think when it comes down to it, smart cities, yes, the technology piece is hard, no offense to the technologists in the audience, <laughs> really important, but it comes down to just very human fundamentals. And at the conference where I was just at, I had the honor to moderate a panel with the former chief of police at the city of Miami, Ray Martinez, and he since for tired and he was just you know being really honest about some of the advice that he has for other people in smart cities facing these kinds of challenges especially in our current environment and his advice was get in front of it get in front of it invite the uncomfortable comments from your community make space for those hard conversations and for the first time at a smart cities conference ever since i've been doing this you had public sector and private sector on the same stage so these are recorded panels everybody knows that they're saying this very publicly saying hi i'm in private sector and i know public sector government employee you're upset because i'm trying to sell you something but i have some expertise and i have some R&D and I really want to co-create with you, what do you need from me? And the public sector government employee is saying, well, I really want your information, but you've never asked me what I wanted. And then the public private sector person said, well, it's really hard because there's 20,000 cities just in the United States alone of all different sizes. Everyone does it differently. How am I supposed to sell my product in when there's no clear way to do that? At the end of the day, I have to make some sales goals. And and so at the end of all of this conversation, they actually agreed to rewrite how this could look. And they agreed to say, let's look at some of our procurement processes and maybe we need to bake in some short-term wins and let's have a longer-term kind of view of smart cities so it's not just about making quarterly goals, but we're really kind of solving this problem together. And I was not moderating that panel, I was in the audience and I couldn't believe it and I'm so happy that we're evolving to that place. And it's possible, I guess that's what I'll leave it Thank you. on. Yeah. That's a wonderful insight. Yeah. Brendan? Yeah, I appreciate you talking about too, like the purchasing side of it. I mean, I think one, one of the major things when it comes to the, the city trying to collaborate with any other institution is the weight of our own bureaucracy, right? Like we're, we're very strongly prevented sometimes from making the best decisions or, or making some of those better decisions. But I would also say that that only, that applies inconsistently as well, right? Mm -hmm because you start to look at that, that like cross-sector, the cross-system collaboration, and, and you can find a lot of instances when the city of Austin has been a very great collaborator with other, with other, with other sectors, right? So when you, talk about, um, when you talk about the decision that council made yesterday, actually, for the airport tank fuel farms, right? Mm -hmm. that, whole, that whole master plan, everything that came in to the decision on the airport deciding to move their jet fuel storage from like kind of the middle kind of isolated area of the airport to the like outer edge to where now it's gonna be within 500 feet of, of some residential homes, right? That specific uh, decision was made, that, that a lot of what kind of carried that through is what's called a fuel consortium, right? So that's the collaboration between all of these different airlines and that's a collaboration with the city of Austin to manage the fuel there. But then you think about all of the permitting, all the stuff they had to go through with like the Environmental Protection Act, right? So then you start talking about federal, you're talking about federal, the aviation, you're talking about the EPA, and all of these entities, all of these groups came together to make this decision without any input from the actual community on it, and we made it like that, right? Mm -hmm. And we circumvented so many different lines within the bureaucracy to make that happen, and then to uphold that decision. And so when we start to talk about that difficulty in collaboration, I think the bigger difficulty is in like collaboration that actually goes to serve people we're trying to serve, right? And, and so much of the challenge with that, right, is that that's something we're struggling with as an institution on our own, right? The Equity Office is doing all of this work to try and like organize, to try and raise this analysis, 
it would require like that side of it, and if it's going to be UT, right? If it's if we're working with UT, then that means that people within UT have to be working to raise that analysis to start to make those more critical, to ask them those critical questions and make better decisions. And then you start to throw industry into the side of it. And and I am waiting for any example of industry making a decision to make less money on behalf of people. So, um, yeah, I think that I think that's more of the the side of it that I look at is like how do we actually start to flip our institutions because. The thing that I really appreciated, I think he, he might have left, but um, the, the man from Supergiant who said before, um, the, the ban hammer, right, or just saying we won't do it, that's something that the city has not really exercised in many fields, and that's something that I, I think we really have to start doing is just being willing to walk away if something is not right. We can't do these like trade-offs anymore where it's like, oh, it's the, the best we can do. We act like this like inevitability, like, oh, these things are happening, so we'll get 5% of what we want. And we need to start saying, no, if it's not everything that we want, we won't do it. Um, but that, that's just me. I'm not a city council member. <laughs> not yet. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Brandon. That's a wonderful, wonderful insight from a uh, from city um, policymaker perspective. The following question is even more interesting. So we talk about smart city. So why we talk about smart city? What kind of benefit a smart city can bring to us? What do, we, what do you want to see? in the smart city movement in the future. On the other side of the coin, what a potential harm um, smart city can bring to us, and what, what should we do to prevent the potential harm? Um, since you're doing the uh, camera research, I'll start with you, Liu. Um, sure, so I'll give everybody a specific uh, uh, example. So we, uh, the research team, went to visit one of the fire department unit in, here in Austin. So they were showing us some of the footage they have collected for various reasons. Mm -hmm. It's not public, but they were the, the spokesperson were categorizing the videos they have into several categories. The first one is just mundane, everything, no information whatsoever. They don't really keep a record of those. That's one. The second is, uh, the example given us is a fire in one of the local warehouses. They were showing us the thermal imaging that's beneath the fire. You may not see the fire, but you know this fire will come up here. So that's very helpful for the fire department to redirect some of the resources to where that's really needed. So that has a lot of uh, utility for education, for training, for you know everything the fire department does. But then there's another category that's when the protests were happening last year. Because the protesters, some of them were setting fire, so the fire department will have to be there. But they have a lot of information now. Who are there, what their demographics are, like this is, they're, they categorized this as a oh, holy crap category. Mm -hmm. They had no idea what to do, and they didn't want to, they showed us, but they didn't want to give us a copy of this. Uh, so some of our, you know, part of our research project was aiming to build a model based on differential access, basically for different level of government, government units, they have different kinds of access to the same data. So maybe blurring faces for the police, but you know, showing location for the fire. So that's the whole premise. But without the data, we can't really do this. So this is the dilemma for the fire department too. They didn't know what to do with this kind of, uh, with this, this kind of uh, uh, information. So I guess uh, the first two category speaks to the benefit, which is usually framed as situational awareness. You wanna know what's happening. You wanna know what our human eyes cannot see to really get the job done. But then the flip side is, what if you get more information? How are you dealing with the information? And we don't have the mechanism in place to really to really deal with that. So that's where the holy crap comes from. Wonderful answer. That's a very interesting insight. Chelsea? Yeah, I think technology and innovation is here, and it is moving at its own speed. And if it only exists and can accelerate in the private sector and not in the public sector, and I'm just using those two sectors, um, then we're going to be in big trouble. And we have a great opportunity right now to leverage technology, innovation, and smart city technology for good. And I think the reason that we are all here and why people are dedicating their professional and academic and government careers um, um, to be able to study this is to answer that question, not just can we, but how do we. Um, I think 
the challenges that are facing us right now in our, our lifetimes are some of the biggest and most complex. Let's just drill down to one, one uh, that's incredibly important, pedestrian deaths. They've increased 17% just in the first half of 2021. That's a very real statistic, and that's not even talking about climate change. So you can go up and down all the different challenges. We have the opportunity to leverage AI, to leverage data, to leverage smart cities, um, and I think that's, that's the great benefit. We have a chance to make our cities more equitable and use technology and information and data to be able to understand that. Um, if we are not very disciplined in, in how we execute the knowledge and, and that those um, the ability to, to analyze that data, then we will get in big trouble and we will have this kind of dystopian community that I think all of us have, makes really good TV, but um, makes a very scary world. So I hope that's answering your question. Thank you, Jeff. Brendan? Yeah, I think there's a lot. I mean, that's a, that's a great example, Chelsea, as far as like the pedestrian deaths. I think they're like the use of AI emerging tech or, or other smart cities applications, I think it really does present us a new tool, a new way to really start to maybe tackle some of these issues um, and, and tackle them, I think, at a deeper level than maybe we're able to at this point. But um, the, the side of it too, like that risk side of it, I think can really not be overstated in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, we obviously the last panel talked a lot about like the concepts of fairness, ethical kind of evaluation of AI, all these things. And 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 I think that, that there, that's come a long ways. I think the other issue though is, is we can talk about our own individual biases showing up within AI, within emerging technology, but there's also that institutional bias that's gonna continue to show up in our AI and in our systems, right? So we can talk about like the perspectives we bring as individuals, but if we're starting to train some of these, these, these like machine learning or, or AI models off of data sets that the city already has, that's data sets that the city has created from this perspective that is still not really critically unpacked our relationship to history and our relationship to our communities of color, right? So if we start just uncritically training it on these like faulty data sets, on, on these like, on basically this, this, um, this pool of data that already has that bias, that those quality of life outcomes built in, then we're just gonna arrive in the same place and continue to perpetuate those same outcomes, right? So it really is, it's, it, it's why I, I think I'm always sort of, um, I'm, I'm a little bit like cynical or I'm not always so like doom and gloom, y'all. Like I'm actually a lot of fun to be around. Um, but <laughs> but it's, it is such a like, I think narrow band of execution for us in the city to actually do this in a way that will have a positive impact. Because frankly, whenever we try and do anything new, we, we deal with that same very like needle threading kind of, of difference in, as far as like the difference between us actually like moving forward, actually advancing equity, and us just continuing to do harm or, or furthering harm. I, I can assure you, at least from my personal perspective, I think City of Austin is doing a wonderful job. <laughs> <laughs> so as we near the close of the discussion, I want to ask each panelist one question, one call for action items. What is the most important thing in your mind to ensure uh, an equitable smart city? I know all of you already touched on that. I will start with Chelsea. Yeah, um, this is personal work. <laughs> so get comfortable with being uncomfortable because we need bold action right now. The time to sit on the sidelines and just be a little bit hesitant is, is over. The challenges are too great. We have to be in front of it. And it's hard to come into a conversation where you think, oof, I don't really have all the answers. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm afraid someone's gonna think that I don't know enough or I haven't experienced enough or I'm gonna say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or offend someone. Come at it with a sense of humility and just do your very best. Get in that game and then when you go into your respective communities your families your organizations invite that spirit of boldness and make the space for everyone to also feel kind of uncomfortable and if you get used to it it's kind of fun <laughs> after a while thank you Chelsea. Leo um, well I think the creation of technology precedes prescribes and eventually but not soon enough produces new social relationships. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the creation of local policy, the building of trust, or the regulation of technology, those are all 
social relations that are not happening. You know, from the previous panel, we talked about the preceding part. We're far behind. And from our research, we realized the prescribing, we need something happening. Mm -hmm. So my call to action for everybody here is, we all have a different role to play. So in your role, what is the most important new social relations that are needing, that needs to be created? Focus on that, and that's where, you know, our work begins. Oh, well said, well said. Brendan? I think maybe just to, I think I agree with what both of y'all said to try and like, I guess, build off of that too, is I would say like the default mode of our systems, the default mode of our institutions is to continue to do harm, right? Like everything that has been set up was set up by and for those who became, who came to be called white, right? If we just continue to do our jobs with good intentions or with like some level of analysis that we know things are messed up, but we're not actually actively doing anything about that, we're going to continue to perpetuate those harms, right? So for me, I think it really is, um, like like you said, Leo, right? That 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 idea of like finding your role, figure out what it is that you control in your it, like whether you're a student, it, like a professor, whoever it is. What is one thing that you actually control? One resource that you can actually start to unpack it and figure out how it is that that continues to play a part in these outcomes, and and with that too, start to unpack that that side of yourself too, as far as what's been done to you, and so. Um, I know that's sort of like an amorphous call to action, so I'm sorry, but really is start to examine how it is that your, your like UT, the city, wherever it is, is operating and how it might not be operating for, for some of our communities of color. Thank you, thank you all our panelists. Thank you, Brandon, thank you, Chelsea, thank you, Leo. We have a few time for a few questions. Uh, I would like to uh, ask our audience to ask a question. Please go ahead. So technology usually comes with the trade-off of the bias that it produces when, when we have to do some choices based on that. So when using some commercial off-the-shelf products, any city will, will face a reduction on the policy choices that it can make. So for the public sector would be, or more for Penn in, in particular, what are the factors that make the city decide to buy something off the shelf or produce it in-house for that freedom in terms of policy choices? And for the private, for the private sector, it would be Chelsea, what could the private sector do to reduce that trade-off between making sales and making use of the economy of scale and enabling local and state governments to have more choices, so the trade-off is not as good, as great. Great question. Do you want to go, go first? Yeah, yeah, I can go ahead and answer that for the city of Austin. And the short answer is, we do not have the capacity, the the like policies, anything like that, to custom build anything like that. Um, it's just, I mean, and and even like exploring that as an idea, we run into so many issues with like the way that we go about procuring technology that it's it's just really not like a feasible thing. So a lot of it is. A lot of it is like uh, companies coming to us and being like, we have this great product that can do X, Y, and Z and like selling us basically a bill of goods. And so, um, it, yeah, it, that, that side of things where it's actually starting to try and proactively build our own things is still, still kind of a dream for us. Yeah, it's a big question and it's a really good question. Um, and I could probably spend another two hours talking about this. So um, I think that industry is learning and they're learning in real time. And what I think that a lot of, and I'm just going to talk about big corporates, you know, startups is a whole other conversation, a really fun one. Um, but big industry is learning that city leaders talk to each other. And I have the really cool role of being in the middle of all of it. So I hear both sides of that conversation. And if you know there's someone who walks in and, and sells a big package to a city and it doesn't go well, the news spreads fast and everyone knows about it. So if industry comes to this with a very short-term attitude, they will lose and they will lose quickly. Industry who can come to it and say, hey, you know, this is what we're thinking. This is what I've learned from you, city leader about what is important to you and your residents and citizens. Um, let's do a really tiny test. Let's do a pilot and let's learn together. And if that's successful, here's how I would like to, to expand that. And then I would like to expand that to multiple cities. That's how you win. 
And I think it's important, too, for those in industry and, and the corporates who get it to also inform people above their chain of command or above uh, uh, this way, the bosses, and those who work um, either below or alongside of them that this is the new way to do business. And if you don't understand that and adjust to it, you won't last very long or be very successful. So it's going to take some time. There's going to be some hard lessons, and there already have. Um, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful answer, Jersey. Uh, yeah, do you want to speak to that? Um, sure. I can uh, share one tiny small comment from one of the researchers we talked to. So one of the issues was uh, another city in California. They were buying uh, technologies from the private sector. But then the problem is they don't know what kind of outsource, you know, contractors, subcontractors are involved. So they can control the first step, but how many steps are there in terms of data sharing, in terms of technology, they don't know for sure. So that's one of the concerns they had. So maybe that's something, you know, the private sector can take into account as well. Yeah. We have one more question on the floor, but I want to take my moderators, nice. or, uh, Uber moderators, uh, prerogative to ask a question. Um, and um, it's a question that um, I think, again, would start with Brandon, but I'd like to hear everybody's take on it. And it has to do, I think, with that problem, Brandon, you talked about of the danger of, um, uh, of overriding what we know about systems and about AI into, into our interactions with the community, but it's also about the, um, you know, some of the more subtle but maybe more um, uh, treacherous problems of uh, collaboration with the community. And um, I, I speak as somebody who's been through actually the um, city community mediation process at the level of the um, neighborhood association and been tremendously impressed by it. So um, I probably just want to kind of know more about, you know, how you all do it. but. It's a question that's inspired by a recent conversation that we had between Good Systems uh, leadership, primarily, and the foundation, uh, some foundation representatives. Anybody here from the foundation world, um, right? People, people who remember that conversation we had with the Knight Foundation, the Ford Foundation, we had three foundation representatives. Um, it's very illuminating, and uh, something that really, I was really taken aback by was uh, how, um, uh, uh, the, the, the degree to which the foundation representatives identified um, uh, social science work in the community as, as much more difficult than anybody had thought <laughs> and potentially uh, much less rewarding even than people in academia you know, had been thinking. They were like essentially cautioning us against putting too much into it. And I think a question that they were raising tacitly, if not explicitly, was the question of um, you know, is there enough deliberation? you know, w within the community that you can tap into and draw on, or in eliciting community input, right? Or are you risking um, kind of sock puppeting, right? You know, community input by, you know, you know, either drawing out a deliberative process that you're kind of engineering, or by drawing, by stoking emotions about an issue, right, that hadn't actually existed there. Now, I don't, I don't believe that the, strong claim about the problem there, you know, would, would really be a fair one, but it does seem like there was some kind of uh, an issue there. So I'm curious what you see on the ground with regard to that. Sure, I think, I mean, I think like the risk of it is only as, I mean, it, the, I wouldn't put like, I guess the lens on community in that way in that case, I would put it more on who it is that's actually doing that engagement. Um, and so I think that the, the the big thing I think with engagement with like I guess also a lot of the work the equity office does is is it's only as good as what you're going to do with that information right so if you're going to go into like if you're going to go in and do engagement with some folks and you're not actually you have no like you've already made these decisions you know the path ahead you're going to take and you're just going in there to basically try and get a rubber stamp or or to really just like be like oh hey this is what we're going to do then that's the issue the issue is not that you went to community the issue is how you went to community um, and I also just want to say again, like you say the word community too many times and all of a sudden it doesn't mean anything. I'm being very clear when I say directly impacted community, right? Specific the, community. That's the term yeah, yeah. 
Um, and so that's that's I think the thing I, that I would say. And I don't the the side of I guess of the social sciences is, uh, work within community too. I think is interesting only because of the relationship that academia has had to those communities as well, right? And the ways that they have used those folks as guinea pigs with no real benefit to them. And so again, I would say the issue there is not community. The issue there is how we are approaching them. Would it be okay if I jumped in there? Oh, yeah, yeah. So one, and I've realized that I left out this part of, of community engagement, but the group who is very rarely asked for their input is creative, creative people and artists. The role of storytelling, the role of music, the role of the arts in helping to express what a community is experiencing, has experienced, wants to experience, and allowing the space for that trauma. I think the trauma exists in our communities in very, very, very real ways. And coming to it and having a fear of unlocking it, I think is missing the real opportunity to co-create with that as an ingredient. Of course it exists. So how can we collectively work towards something that, um, I don't want to say mitigates it, but helps to heal that and moves forward? Um, that, Chelsea, that's a great point. I think there's a mutual imaginary between the public and the technology. Mm -hmm. The public is imagining the technology to do stuff that they're not actually doing. There's an imagined affordance, you know, happening here. So that's a great point. So uh, what I want to add is uh, maybe, you know, we have a data scientist on the team. They were very frustrated with the lack of data. But from a media communication perspective, the lack of data is an in interesting finding in itself. So, you know, back to your question, our lowering our, our expectation in terms of what we are finding, the lack of, you know, practice happening on the ground is an indication that something needs to happen. So that comes back to the, the prescribing part. We need to create new social relations, relations for this to happen. So that would be my response. Last question. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the great panel. So I, I was. So you talked a lot about the challenges, but can you also elaborate a little bit on what are the in your experience? What are the best practices for the researchers who want to get involved in this type of research, and who people who want to get involved in and work with the non-private, uh, non-public, private sectors, and you know the government organizations? Thank you. I can start. So part of my job is to cyber stock stakeholders <laughs> and, and invite them to speak with us, whether in focus groups, interviews, or just doing a survey. So it's really important on my part to realize who I'm looking at, who I'm not looking at. So the, 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 the composition of the people we're inviting and we're getting is the first step in you know getting the fairness and equity into our research. So that's a tiny practice, maybe something we can consider. I think look at any part of a city from pavement to water pipes to air quality to urban design, anything that is a part of our, our physical environment or even non-physical environment and ask a question, how can data technology and, and sensor um, technology contribute to a positive outcome. And it's really fun to sit down and just nerd out with people in public works, and they will talk so eloquently about pavement integrity or um, leaky pipes or anything within a city system and get really excited when they have data as a tool to help them make smarter decisions, which ultimately improves people's lives within their own sector. So it's limitless in terms of, of where you can go. Um, I think it's just a matter of what are you most interested in, follow your heart on where to start. Yeah, I think that's the, both of those are very good pieces of advice. I would also just say, I think, just speaking from my own experience, uh, uh, actually working on a good systems project uh, a couple years, last year, whenever that was, um, I would say also is one thing that I think we run into a lot too is, is sort of like those sort of different ends, right? So when we show up in a project, right, there's always the chance that we're just gonna end up being like, okay, we don't think this can move forward because there is also a real risk in just like legitimizing some of these systems that, that we know might cause, cause harm and then they kind of like spread, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so one thing that I, one frustration or one concern I think I always had, right, is sort of that 
that conflict between like the need for researchers for folks to publish right and then the need for us to also just try and make sure that we're not causing harm right so i think the other thing i would say is is like chelsea talked about earlier maybe showing up with like and at me as well like it's on me as well right that humility right as far as being like okay let's really try and like start from zero so this is the thing you're interested in let's really work from there to try and build what it is that we want to do from there because i think if you if you kind of just show up and you're like okay we have we have all of this already figured out and you're coming to somebody in public works or whoever, it's like, well, I don't really know what I'm gonna do with that or, or I don't know if this is really the thing. So I think also starting early and, and really proactively building that kind of, that, that collective vision. Thank you, thank you. I, I see everybody is still awake. So uh, please join me to thank our panelists.